guys and think Teddy, about that? Because most people at the time when he was president, they really hid his disability. What did I? I hate it. I. Um, I think that's appropriate. I feel like I don't know, like what would happen in the current times because. We are in a time now where people with disabilities are part of the world. I was actually just thinking about this when I was trying to get ready, like how, you know, like all these protests that have happened to get our rights, it required people with disabilities to protest the way able-bodied people protested in order that, you know, like they had to be physically present and be like, hey, we need this, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that would play out now, but I do think when FGR was president, people definitely thought, you know, getting polio and disability made you a weak person. So, right. I, like, you know, representing the country, he became president. I mean, he might have not even gotten elected if people knew he was in a wheelchair. I don't really know. I feel... Yeah. But I, that sounds about right. I think it would have been, I think it would have been a cool part of history, though. It but you wouldn't would know. So Jessica, did you want to say something about that? Um, well, I was, uh, I'm reading the Judith Humor book, and she, she actually mentioned that in there, that her parents' generation, you know, the, that the, the FDR was president, and um, like having a disability was shameful, and people wanted it to be hidden, and, you know, when it was her generation, they were, they were more accepting. Um, of their disability, and they were proud of it. So I yeah. think it's just a matter of you know two types of generations. I do think because FDR was disabled, I think he also had so much empathy, and he really you know he passed the New Deal, and it, and a lot of programs that still exist today that help people was because of him, and I think his disability helped him be a better president even though people didn't know about it <laughs> well you know i've been doing the radio for a while and today they offered me a full-time job like for their website like doing the social media oh, nice. and working at the radio and working at the radio station and i'll be getting some income that's so awesome i get it from and then what else was, what was my win this week? I got to go to the lake and I was featured in the Mighty's newsletter. Well, I guess I'd have some a win. Like I, I'm an artist and a musician, and um, I started making zines, which I'm not sure if anybody knows what those are, but there's a whole history of it, like since the 30s. But they're self-made publications. And then in the 80s, it became more part, you know, became part of popular culture. But I decided when I get disabled, means about disability, and then also have my, I'm a photographer. So <coughs> three bodies of work, one called Completely Tilted Back, which because my wheelchair tilts back really far, and they're all pictures I've taken of what I see when I'm tilted back. And then when I got my van, because I did a fundraiser to get a van so I could drive. So I did two bodies of work, one called View from a Lift. So I took pictures of what I see from my lift. And, and then from the driver's seat, which of course, I don't have as many pictures because I can't take pictures while I'm driving. Right. So I stop like, what happens at the stop? Line? Like, oh, look, <laughs> so I have those three bodies of work, and I made photograph scenes out of them. And someone bought one a long time ago, and they're doing, they're doing a magazine. Like, I think it'll be a quarterly release, and it's called, uh, God, Still Printed, or something like that, like talking about things that are still printed. And so she wants to interview me about, about uh, that. I got a win, and... I'm working on this interview, so. Yeah, I am, and I am a hopeless romantic, so. 
So yeah, hopeless romantic, but I like people that are. Right, yes. <laughs> if it's not beaten out of you by the age of, what, 21, it's gonna, it, you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. Oh, well, I'm 20, <laughs> I'm gonna be 25, so I'm stuck. Hopeless romantic forever. <laughs> I just feel like every time I break up with somebody, that just brings me one little closer to the person I am supposed to be with, so. That's actually, it's always a number game. Whether it's girlfriends, boyfriends, or people at the bar. <laughs> okay, we all know Sam's not a hopeless romantic then. <laughs> like, I always tell people when I'm, like, interested in dating them and they're interested in dating me, they're like, um, how's your disability affect you? I said, well, my wheelchair and I are a package deal. So, hey. Yeah, buy one, get one free, and they usually laugh about it, but I'm just like, it's true. But it's, yeah, that's the reality. <laughs> or I always say, I'm a hottie on wheels. <laughs> you got the hot wheels. Hot wheels, yeah. hey! Yeah. Beat that! You can tap into their psych child psychology. <laughs> Did you like hot wheels? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm a hot <laughs> Baby, I'm hottie on a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna hashtag Hot Wheels now. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean. I'm honored to be part of this um, group of folks. It's 10 people with different disabilities um, all, that are all writing and sharing their own little experiences. Um, and it's called Naturally Able, and I'll put that in the, in the chat box. Um, it just got, Lisa Wells has had it for a while and she used to be with Pure Medical and you know, did, um, oh, she's worked on a lot of magazines and been in the durable medical equipment world for a long time and she has an invisible disability. Mm -hmm. um, and so even she has one and um, we're just trying to create a space to share what's going on um, in our different communities, the, the good stuff. Um, and how we're working together and yeah it's just it's an exciting space one of the best qualities she taught me growing up with a disability is that you have to fight for yourself and you have to speak up because if it wasn't for her teaching me how to go into those iep meetings and going crazy and speaking up for what she wanted for me because she knew what's best for me i wouldn't be as strong as i am today and another thing she taught me was strength. I mean, she had me at a very young age. She had me at 16. My biological father left the picture because I was disabled and we had to go through the unthinkable. And through that, she came out strong. So she taught me how to overcome op obstacles, being a teen mother with the child with a disability and no support. Um, yeah, um, both my parents actually um, helped me through my disability and um, made me stronger. They both wanted me to go to college. They both wanted me to be better than um, what I just wanted to like give up probably because School was really hard and everything. So yeah, pushed me to help me um, um, graduate. And um, if it weren't for them, I don't think I'd be here. My mom um, always um, enforced in me to be like independent. So I think that helped um, with it perseverance and determination. We um, butted heads a lot growing up, but um, I've come to appreciate it and understand where she was coming from. My mom was actually disabled. She had rheumatoid arthritis okay. all my up. But, you know, growing up with that, I, I, we, it was never framed as it being a disability because it was in 1965 when this happened. I was born in 68 and that's when it's the degenerate started. So all my life, I watched her ability decline, the older I got and the older she got. And we had a very tumultuous relationship because like me, she was stubborn and had her own opinions and I had my own no. opinions. <laughs> oh. 
We fought a lot. No. My, no. My parents came from India, so like my mom, I think, had this image of what her daughter was supposed to be, and I didn't fit into that at all. Most people that I was in the hospital with were had gotten really, you know, freaked out by it and stuff. And I don't know. I just it was just weird for me because I was just like, okay. How will I do what I want to do with this disability? And I think it was because my mom did things she wanted to do, you know, and it didn't translate to me till years later, someone was interviewing me about being disabled and they're like, so when did you realize your mom was disabled? And I was like, oh, I don't know. We, I still don't consider her disabled. So it was just really weird. like. That was a realization to me that we never talked about my mom being disabled and not getting her rights. It was just like we and family just worked together and made things happen. The example she just set as the person remained with me and I, I think helps me to this day. I have a, this is a story that I always like to tell about my mother because of how, what impact it made on me. And um, if you, you guys, for those who already know me, kind of know my not arrogant. Uh, 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 but anyway, so you're uh, unique. Now. <laughs> my aggressive nature. Anyways, so uh, it comes from my mother. Um, the the idea is uh, so. Th what happened was growing up uh, in grade school, I was uh, I, like just. Just like most other disabled people, you get bullied a lot. Just because you look different, be different. Um, not uncommon for a lot of disabled folks. Uh, but I remember one time I came back crying and I came back home and I was crying. And uh, my mom was like, why are you crying? And she, I go, oh, they're you know, making fun of me. They're, they're doing this, they're doing that. And I said, and she's like, okay, well, what? outside of the bullying what else can they do and then i was like i don't know what can you do she's like how do you so she's like well obviously they're not you're not strong enough to fight them which i would beg to differ now um <laughs> but uh the but she basically said you know with if if you want if you want to prove the naysayers wrong or if you want to prove, prove your bullies wrong you got to rise above them and there's no other better way to rise above them than to be smarter than them. And that's always been that my motivating factor all through my life. I think the whole thing of getting disabled later on in life is like a whole different deal. It's like a different experience. It doesn't mean that it's better, or worse or anything. I'm not putting a judgment on it. It's just really different. It's been nothing but denial since I got this. Our family doesn't get it, you know, they're just like, oh, you're imagining. I mean, I don't have that issue because my, you know, as you know, my, my mom was disabled, so this wasn't a weird thing for my family, but there are people that are like that. They just don't get it, and it sucks when it's your own family. Well, and I feel like a lot of times the way people respond to different things, like such as your ms is really a reflection of their discomfort to deal with stuff that they don't get or that is maybe confronting them on different levels so um you know when you see them this summer i don't know if this will help but not taking that on not owning their their responses right that's their responses it's a reflection of what their internal beliefs are about things, whether it be disability or illnesses or whatever you have, um, but that's, you know, that's theirs. And no, I think no matter what links you send them, they're still, <laughs> they're not in a space in their mind to be able to receive that. Yeah. Just, just, a, just a personal opinion, um, because I, even though I am not a, uh, even though I haven't been disabled later in life or became disabled later in life, I can understand that from another perspective because of the fact that I am not a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist and uh, coming from an Asian community that is very similar where denial is the path. Um, 
I, I know for, for myself that like it was one of those things where I just had to accept that um, my parents were naysayers and I basically had to move on because I had a, a career goal and I again they don't see it as a career they don't even think I have a job um, and it's one of those things where for me uh, I have a distinct goal in my life that's always been the reason why I've I've been able to continue to you know do what I do and continue to be as vocal as I am and I know that when it comes to something like MS because I have had friends with MS that I've not seen it getting worse and worse and worse um it's just one of those things where like you just have to just just disregard don't expect anything from your family at that point because um, ultimately you have to be able to live with you and what's under your skin and that's one of those things where like MS is going to get worse it's, 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 there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it that's, and that's, so that's what I keep trying to tell them but they're not getting All right, that's a really, I get what you're saying because every yeah, so time they I, visit I push myself, I don't sleep I get up early when I don't usually right. you know, I, I try to do their game and you're right, right, I should probably just say, okay guys you know, I get six hours of waking time a day. Deal with it, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, for you, it's like one of those things where you cannot negotiate that. It's just not something you negotiate. It's a hard line. Um, because it's like, it's the reality that you live in. So it's like, why, at that point, why even bother to continue to convince them to basically ignore it? Or not ignore it, but just brush it off. Just try and to manage your own stress so that you're 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 living a happier life because at some point you're not going to be able to convince them and it's just if they won't understand it they they will refuse they could refuse to understand it um they could deny it but it's still a reality that you have to live in and if if that's the reality that you live in then you have to do what's right for you to protect your own mental health and your own Mental That's stability. Because you, like, you're, like, you're internalizing what's going on with you. You know, you're related to these people, so they're also internalizing how they feel about what's going on with you because they can't do anything about it. And so maybe their reaction is like, ah, this isn't, if you just do this, it'll be better. And it's like, that's how they deal. You know, everyone has mental issues and they deal with it how they can. It's been really interesting. You guys are great. <laughs> yeah. Living life guilt-free is probably one of the best things you can do yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I've, 50 I've done so I much stuff. I don't give a shit about anything. And I'm sorry I'm using I've this done. Shit, but that was like, I turned 50 and I was like, I don't care what any of you people think. Get the hell out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Pauline. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Happy Mother's Day.